Queensland branch of the AIG would like to welcome everyone to today's RPG eForum series. Today's talk comes from Rod Carlson of AMC Consultants and he's going to speak about resource estimation from expiration to tunnel grade. Rod is a principal geologist and geology manager for AMC's Brisbane office. He has extensive management and consulting experience and is highly experienced in areas including resource estimation and audit, mine to mill reconciliation, geochemistry, drilling interpretation and regular mapping. He's worked across numerous commodities including gold, copper, bauxite, platinum and coal. He has extensive international experience including projects in Australia, Indonesia, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Oman amongst others. Prior to joining AMC in 2015, Rod started his consulting career at Snowden's in 2013 after having spent over 11 years with Ingress Mining. Early on in his career he worked for companies such as Pancon and Mining, Guardian Resources, Goldfields and RSG. He is a graduate from the University of Canberra with a Bachelor of Applied Science in Geology and has completed a Master of Science in Geology from the University of Western Australia. I'd now like to introduce Rod Carlson. Uh, it's all yours. All oh, right. Okay. So sorry, everybody, but we love uh, IT and all things go wrong. Okay. Let's move on to it. Okay. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the range of things that we need to think about when we're moving from exploration towards a block model and a resource estimate. Um, here's a range of things that are inputs to uh, the process, you know, you, you've got your laboratory, you've got your geology, you know, there are different times where different things are important. The one really interesting takeaway for me out of this slide is that geology is critical right the way through from exploration to grade control. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things I want to try and stress today is that no matter how uh, difficult the estimate is, geology is still and always will be the most important part of it. Obviously, to make money, you've got to get your mining engineering and your metallurgy and your marketing and all your social licensing happening. But if you don't get the geology right in the first place, you're going to end in with crap in and crap out. So from an explorationist point of view or from a mining geologist point of view, the models are always wrong. You know, we, we know they're wrong because don't have all the information we need to make them right. We're, we're relying on the data that we have at a point in time. And that might be anything from a trench, a drill hole, to an open pit, underground development. And we have to understand how to measure that. We have to understand how to estimate that to the best of our ability. Clearly, you know, the, the figure one from Jork, we'll come back to it again later. That is the major thing that underpins uh, resource estimation. It's how confident can we be that the information that we have at that point in time is valid for the classification that we apply in terms of the risk. So for mineral resources, Obviously, we move from inferred to indicated to measured with increasing geological knowledge and confidence. And as we move into the mining engineering side of things, the ore reserve side of things, we have to consider all of the other aspects other than geological risk matter to whether we can make it an economic prospect, whether we can actually mine this thing, make money, and uh, we have all the, the licensing to do that. So I'll just break it down a little bit, usual sort of three things that we deal with when we're talking about uh, a resource estimate. Uh, we, we start with the inputs, uh, we move through an analysis phase once we essentially uh, typically cut off data. We say, all right, well, at a point in time, this is all the data we have, let's move into an analysis phase. Interpretation might be ongoing. It might be something that happens during the input phase and should, of course, the geologist should be thinking about his model at all points in time, whether it's the first or the 300th drill hole. Um, and then, of course, we move into estimation and the, the classification and reporting. So let's start at the beginning and we look at our inputs. Well, you know, many times we start with a, a surface mapping, 
Uh, if you're in the outback of WA, you don't because it's all covered with shit and you don't really know what's in the in the bedrock more often than not. Um, but you might have pit mapping, you might have underground mapping, and of course you more often than not have drilling to assist you with predicting what is beneath the surface and might be uh, able to assist you to predict uh, the model. Now, I mean, in Australia, of course, trenching was a very big thing in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, and before that, uh, we, we, the, the, the outback of WA was covered in trenches where people decided that it was the best way to map and get data and, and assay things. But of course, it's only relatively useful where you've got no cover or very little cover. And, uh, but there are places in the world where trenching is still very, very prominent. Um, here is an example from Russia, uh, but they still do do it in Papua New Guinea and West Africa where, you know, there's shallow soils and you can get quite valuable information about structure, uh, about chemistry, although commonly the chemistry is not all that useful in a resource estimate. That said, the Russians do use it on a regular basis because they've got virtually no weathering because it's all been glaciated off and uh, you know, they take the samples as uh, equivalent to a drill hole in quality. So drilling is our main tool in Australia and many other parts of the world. Uh, but you know, what sort of drilling are we dealing with? Uh, is it a RAB rig, an air core rig, a diamond drill hole rig, an RC rig? What are the, the recoveries? These are things that we have to bring into our understanding around risk is what are the, the aspects of the drilling that matter to the resource estimate. We certainly need to be, as an exploration geologist, recording absolutely as much information as we can about things like sample recovery, sample mass, what are the quality, how are we managing quality, are we, are we accepting the fact that our RC samples are wet, um, are we going to say, no, we're not going to use it apart from to give us some indication for geology? Do we know what the risk is around sampling wet or damp, damp samples? How much information have we got about the geology? Are we drilling in the right direction? How are we subsampling? Are we using a rotary cone splitter? Are we using a riffle splitter? Are we sampling with a pipe out of a bag? You know, all of these things are critical pieces of information. Maybe not to you now, but it is to the estimator at the end of the day because it all moves into that risk equation for the uh, classification of the resources. Density is, it's well understood that density is one of those items that we need to measure and record on a regular basis. Of course, with diamond core, it's relatively easy. You can, you know, take your sample, but you know, is, is it is it porous? Is it has it got cavities in it? Do we need to deal with those? Are we in the oxidized zone and poor recovery is poor? Do we take a you know 60 centimeter sample of good core and assume it's valid for the for the meter or the 20 meters of that particular lithotype? You know, all of these items are things that we have to consider. Uh, when we're moving through the phases of interpretation and estimation. Uh, geophysics uh, as an input is, is, is very present in, in certain areas. Obviously, in coal is one of the prime examples where we use the, uh, the density uh, gamma gamma plots to help guide the seam picks, which give us the thickness of the seams. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we use, in some cases, uh, you know, gravity or IP or EM or uh, you know, any other geophysical tool you like to help guide where we don't have enough information. Sometimes it's amazing what you can see uh, to help you uh, guide whether it's structure or the actual ore body itself. It's, it's, it's quite um, a valuable tool. Uh, you know, it's not common that we use raw geophysical data in uh, an estimation methodology. I mean, you know, we might use, uh, there are cases where we use density as, as, a tool, as one of the measures of uh, the estimate, uh, but the tools that we use to measure density are very dependent on a whole range of things, uh, like the, the whole size, the roughness of the wall, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so density is, 
it's a risk if you're using a downhole uh, geophysics tool, in my experience anyway. Um, if we move on to uh, interpretation, you know, they're the ones that, that as a geologist we need to do right from the word go. Are we dealing with a geological ore body that is the ore, that's a simple ore body? Is it a strata bound, strata form type ore deposit? You've got very clear definition of the boundaries between ore and waste. And, uh, you know, you, you, Brian Trady could work out how to put a boundary around it and give you an estimate. Um, and, and there are many cases where these are relatively straightforward. The other cases are where you've got very complex ore bodies, you've got folding, you've got faulting, you've got mineralisation that it, it, it can't really necessarily be tracked between holes. You've got to really put on your thinking caps, use every scratch of geological information to help guide where your interpolated boundaries to war zones might be. So, you know, that's a really critical. And we've got many, many tools now to help us. Uh, you know, obviously leapfrog and, and interpolation using leapfrog, whether it's a, a, a vein model or a, um, a you know, a interpolation model for grade, are very valuable tools if used with experienced personnel who know how to manage the risks around that particularly modelling style. Um, but the old cross-sectional um, interpolation is still going to be one that, as a geologist, I would recommend you do. Getting out a, a coloured pencil, using your brain, working out how to best, uh, with the best information that you have available, cater for all the variables. So, in your interpretation, of course, it's not just your mineralization that you might want to take into account because your block model has to take into account all of the variables. So whether it be metallurgical, density, uh, or grade, and these things can all be, or, or geotechnical, in fact, of course, is, is another risk. So your interpretation may end up being an extremely complex one with many, many, many subdomains where you have to split rock types by oxidation domains with alteration overprints, cross-cutting faults, and then you add in your mineralization. So you, you really have to be aware that a block model requires all of these elements uh, where relevant to be catered for. And uh, taking that into account as you build up your data picture is a, is a really, really important one. Whether it's from a, a small uh, West Australian shear hosted vein through to a multi-billion ton porphyry copper deposit. All of these items need to be considered. Domaining is, is singly the most important role the geologist has in the process. He, he is the person that must guide how we look at the data. If we get domaining wrong, there are serious implications around the estimation methodologies that we use. We could use the best system in the world, the most uh, you know, perfect uh, domaining and estimation system and still get it very, very wrong. So we need to be careful, we need to utilise all of that data, not rely where possible just on grade. If the deposit is a deposit that is so complex that you really have difficulty segregating, you know, uh, you know vein arrays where there's multiple orientations of mineralisation, there's cross-cutting alteration styles, you, 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 you're really puzzling, then you have to recognise that and use appropriate methodologies that take that into account and use it to generate global estimates rather than local estimates. And there are tools around that that help um, you define what the global grade of a deposit might be, but are less able to assist you at a local level. So by local levels, we can be talking in underground mining at the metre scale 
or in open pit mining, local levels might be at a bench scale. So it does depend on mining style. And that again is another consideration when we're domaining is how do we want to uh, estimate what sort of block sizes are we talking about? Is it open pit? Is it underground? What are the methodologies we might use that impact those decisions? So where we domain, how we domain, what's your orientation of drilling relative to those mineralization domains or the important domains you're trying to estimate, um, all of them are, are really, really important. And where you've got high variability, uh, you need to de-risk that by using appropriate methodologies. Part of the process of estimation is understanding that your, your use of statistics is reliant upon a number of fundamental statistical parameters that allow you to estimate from the known to the unknown. So, if we're dealing with samples that have different sample lengths, which are typically diamond drill holes, well, typically RC holes have a consistent sample length, um, but there are sometimes variables. Um, but diamond holes, typically you're sampling to lithology and you'll have variations even if you have a standard sample length. So why do we need that standard sample length? Well, it's because the, uh, the appropriate use of statistics requires that we're dealing with a variable that is consistent in certain dimensions and that the grade and factors are, are not additive in a statistical world when you've got variable sample lengths. The metal might be, but the grades are not. So, how do we take that into consideration? Well, we use composites, which is we can merge data together to make it a certain length. We use composites, and I'll give some examples in a minute, that allow us to standardize the length of the sample and make the population equal probable of having a grade of a particular, you know, within that length of that composite, the grades are all going to be codependent. You can rely on the statistics because the sample lengths are similar. Now, what does that look like? Well, here's just a short, very simple graphical example. On the left, you've got samples of similar length. We calculate the mean, it's 2.24. On the right-hand side, if we multiply the grades and the lengths and we get a grade length, obviously the weighted mean is very different. So we have to length weight the grade to make it meaningful. In the same way composites are, if you, if you take these things into consideration, the grade needs to be consistently applied uh, to a sample length, and that's why we composite. And there are different ways of catering for the gaps that those standard sample lengths apply in a drill hole. For example, here, if we are using, in this case, a three meter composite down a drill hole, in some cases, you're going to have residuals that are left over that are not three meters at a boundary between two rock types or two, you know, a weathering boundary or whatever it is. And you have to have apply a standard methodology across your uh, deposit. And there's three or four ways of doing that. You can retain the, the gaps, you can make all of the intervals the same width for a particular domain, you can you know, decide to leave out the residuals. But it depends on the data. If you're dealing with narrow vein quartz veins, for example, you actually want to keep as much data as you can within the vein because it's that's a really critical data point. And you know, populations, the more samples you have, the more likelihood you have of being able to estimate it uh, correctly. So compositing is one of the very early steps in your uh, domain estimation, statistical evaluation, that's a critical step. 
statistics then can be done on, we've got a domain, we've got a three dimensional domain, we've said all of the samples within this domain are part of that, and we'll run the composites within that domain. What is your population? What do your statistics look like? And we run a variety of statistics. And again, a statistical process of whether it's a normal, a log normal a distribution is a critical thing to understand to be able to estimate it correctly, to be able to predict in the areas that you don't know what the grade is, what the grade might be. So different elements commonly have different distributions. Typically, your uh, precious metals, your golds, your silvers, your platinums have a very negatively, uh, sorry, positively skewed, uh, highly abnormal distribution. And it's, it's a, you know, it, it may be log normal, it may not be. Um, a high grade base metal deposit might have a, a population approaching a normal or bell curve distribution. And in the, in, the, in the high grade iron ore deposits, you commonly have uh, a, a negative skew and a, and, a, and a distribution out the other way. So that just, it means that you have to treat different elements in different ways. You have to look at it and understand it and work out how to estimate it. Now, statistics commonly wants to be working in a normal population, a bell curve type operation, because that makes it more predictable. How do we know if we have or have not got a normal distribution apart from looking at the basic statistics? Well, one of the basic statistics is, is a coefficient of variation, where we're looking at the standard deviation over the mean, the distribution, the standard deviation, um, and the mean of that population gives you your CV. And, you know, they help us guide uh, the variability between populations with different grades, and it also helps us to understand whether top cuts are needed. Because if you have a high CV, you're dealing with outliers and you're dealing with an area where uh, the normality is not going, is, is unlikely. And it, you, your statistical ability to predict is lower. So here is a, is a graph of coefficient of variation versus the mean grade. And you've got a, a space where on the left-hand side, at low grades with high coefficients of variation, you're going to be moving into areas where it's difficult to predict grade distribution. On the right-hand side, as you go higher in grade, and as you go down the graph with lower coefficients of variation, you're going to be more likely to be able to predict uh, because of the way that we can uh, use that statistical approach and predict grade. So we've run our statistics in our domains. We've decided I'm not going to stress top cuts too much. You know, they're a method, there's a complex uh, decision-making processes about how you uh, and when you to use top cuts. It is a critical method. Although these days, more and more, we're moving uh, towards restricting high grades, perhaps more than top cutting, or combinations of the two, uh, because the, the statistical and uh, geostatistical methods are changing as we, uh, as we improve and get more and more experience with uh, data uh, and reconciliation from mining. So moving on to variography, I know I'm probably about 10 or 15 minutes to go, given the fact that I completely stuffed up the start of things by crashing the computer, but I'll try and move through variography. It's, it's a process. And the statistical bell curve assumes that your domain has population where the domain has stationarity. Now, what is stationarity? It's a term that's used around the place. I'm not going to describe it in detail other than saying that your population, if it has stationarity, means that you can deal with it statistically in a meaningful way. So there are different types of stationarity. Uh, the descriptions of what it is is on this slide. Um, and it, it 
it really does mean that your domains, if you do them correctly, have a statistical validity and an ability to be predicted away from the data. If you have, don't have stationarity, you end up with an example down there in the bottom right where your histogram has a clear bimodal population. It's got a low grade population below about two and it's got a high grade population above about two. So you can see there are two populations, they've got different means, they've got different standard deviations and you cannot apply a single statistical parameter to predict grade using that sort of histogram. So that means you, if you get that out of your domain statistics, it means you need to change your domain or change the way you deal with it in your estimation methodology. You have to cater for it. So the, the, it's really important that we try to domain out that because that's geologically the most meaningful. If we can't, then there are tricks that we can use to uh, uh, get away with it or reduce the risk of uh, getting it wrong, um, even though you end up losing uh, precision in that method. Now, we'll use some standard terms in variography. The variogram uh, or you know, uh, experimental variogram is a set a way of sort of comparing pairs of data. You're comparing a, uh, n pairs of data in n dimensional space, which is a complicated say, way of saying it looks at a set of pairs of data a certain distance apart and says, what is the variance between those pairs? It sums up the variances and divides it by the number of samples minus one. And it gives you a feel for how variable a set of uh, likelihoods is of a grade being the same in a particular direction. And as you approach zero distance, you may, or you are more than likely, to have what they call the nugget in this diagram on the left hand side. The nugget is that intrinsic variability at zero distance. You know geologically that you've got a gold nugget, right next to it is going to be nothing. If it's a, a strata bound, or you know, let's say a gypsum deposit, a gypsum deposit right next to that little gypsum crystal is going to be another gypsum crystal. And that's going to have a a zero nugget effectively. So you, you have to take into account what is worth, what the nugget might be. A gold and a, a, a platinum will have more than likely to be high nuggets, your base metals, medium nuggets, and some of your other uh, elements will have lower nuggets. You then move out to the range, and the range in this case is the point at which the pairs of data have a maximum variability. After that distance, the pairs are randomly um, uh, variable. The variance doesn't increase. Uh, and then, of course, the sill is the point, uh, the, the distance at which the maximum variation um, uh, occurs and it doesn't get better or worse. So that, broadly speaking, is what a variogram is. How do we use it? Well, we use it to provide directionality to the grade estimation. Within a particular block or set of blocks or a particular domain, we say the grade is going to be estimated on the nearest sample in this direction or set of samples or set of drill holes. And we have to define all of those issues. But variography is very, very, very strongly influenced by directionality of drilling and how much drilling it is. I guarantee you that if you're drilled out of West Australian shear zone gold, your shear zone strike length is going to be your direction of maximum continuity more often than not. You might be able to domain it out, but your drilling is going to drive what the maximum uh, continuity is. So we have to be careful in deposits where we're not able to drill perpendicular to the ore body because of topographic issues. Here's an example, an extreme example, where you literally can't drill anywhere other than the top of the hill and the bottom of the hill, just because there's almost vertical cliffs 
all over the place. And so you get the suboptimal drilling direction and that can influence your variograms. As you see on the, uh, on the blue, uh, blue drill holes on the right hand side that are coming across at a low angle, they're able to intersect the mineralization uh, at a lower angle and give you a much better feel for what the downhole continuity and what the cross hole continuity might look like. So variogram ranges are the key that we need to understand. They're how far can we see in a particular direction that is meaningful? What is the major, when you define a variogram and you generate it or you get your specialist to generate it, where are they seeing the major direction? Get them to plot their, uh, their disc or their um, you know, spheroid in the drilling and say, what does it look like? Well, yeah, it's, it's along the strike length for maximum continuity. It's across the strike length for the, uh, the semi-major and the minor is that thickness. And you know, it makes perfect sense. You've got to follow that up. You've got to visualize it and understand it. So the interrelationships is really, really important that you understand what your drill hole data is telling you and how it interacts with the variograms. Um, is a 500 metre search radius bad if all the estimates are fine examples within a, a criteria that is, is within 125 metres? Well, probably not because it doesn't look at the samples beyond that. So you've got to understand all the variables. It's, a long complex process to understand all of them. So here we've got an example in a block model where we've got a series of uh, uh, ellipses which are indicating what the variogram is looking at in terms of search uh, length and a search width. And in certain circumstances, you can get it wildly wrong if your ellipse is too wide. If you've got very narrow vein uh, parameters, but it's within a domain that's quite wide, your variography might say, oh, well, you've got a, you know, quite a, a big search ellipse that you can look at. But of course, that has implications at a local level where you might be looking across boundaries and looking at low grade samples from the high grade sample area. And so you have to be careful. You have to make sure that your domaining and your uh, variography line up and that, that allows you to see what the prediction of grade might be. So here's an example where we're using different search thickness, uh, search widths. Uh, they're both 30 by 30, but the top ones are 15 meter searches, the bottom ones are 12 meter searches. So it allows, you can see that there's a difference in the grade estimation that will uh, allow you to predict the veins better. It gives you a little bit more continuity. It gives you a little bit more direction and it doesn't push the low grade into the high grade. I won't go into a lot of detail here. It's just saying that you have to be careful when you're doing these things. There's no simple way to uh, run a, a, an estimate. When you do an estimate, you want the data that's closest to your block model to give it the most information. And your way of managing that is by doing, but you also want your block model to be filled with information throughout the block model in general. You want to make sure that there's actually information in every block in your block model. And you do this by doing a number of passes and increasing the search distance each time. Your variography gives you the influence. It gives you the direction and the proportional influence of those samples but the pass parameters give you the difference in the search distances, the number of drill holes you use, and the number of samples you use in each drill hole, which are critical to the estimate for that particular block. If you have a maximum and minimum number of samples that are very different, say if you're saying a minimum of three samples, but a maximum of uh, say 12 samples in a drill hole, if all of your 12 samples are within the block, it's going to give you a very different number than if you say minimum three, maximum six, because it forces it then to look outside of that particular drill hole. 
So the number of samples is a really, really critical issue to cons consider based on your drill spacing, based on your variography, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many aspects to estimation that will mean that you are uh, needing to uh, consider that it's, it's really an expert's game and it's a risk that if you, if you think you know everything, believe me, you don't. It, 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 it takes years and years and years of looking at these things to understand the risks associated with various aspects of estimation. Declustering is another one of the steps along the way where data is commonly clustered together. You, you're aiming your drill holes to find information in those ore zones and you might end up with a lot of data in one place and very little data in other places. Those uh, clustering causes problems within the global statistics. It, 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 it gives preference to those samples that are closer together and the samples that are further away have less influence. But that may not be what you want. You want to see what those sample influence is further away statistically. And so you use declustering, which is a, a methodology that gives uh, sample spacing equal weighting. So if you've got a lot of samples in one space, it sort of moves, smooths them out and says this is one result rather than 50 and allows you to see the statistical differentiation across the domain more accurately. It's a complex thing. There are lots and lots of papers about declustering. I've just recommended one here in Jackie Coombs' book, which is for me one of the, the essentials as a, a non-geostatistician to really try and understand what some of the concepts are. Lastly, I just wanted to talk about end results in terms of the estimation methodology. You need to be careful. You need to make sure that the numbers that you're looking at within each domain are giving you the right sort of results. The old classic uh, square here, where if you're in the bottom left or the top right, you've got it right. It's either waste in the bottom left or it's ore in the top right. If you're mining it and you end up in the top left hand side, you've got ore grade, but it's been allocated as waste because it's below cutoff. In the bottom right, you've got material that's been allocated as ore, but should have been allocated as waste. That angle, that slope angle of that curve, that, that distribution is a critical thing and it's called the conditional bias. And you will get that. But the lower the slope, the more likely you are to misclassify material. So you want that slope to be as close to one as possible. And there are statistical procedures that will allow you to see what that slope of regression might be and try and minimise it. It's one of the things you have to really watch for because otherwise, as in with most mines, you end up with more tonnes at a lower grade than predicted in the model. Okay, back to classification, good old figure one in the chalk code, we're talking about inferred, indicated and measured. What is inferred? What is indicated? What is measured? Ah, that's the decision of the competent person. But how does the competent person know what is inferred, indicated and measured? Well, the chalk code tells him or her that inferred is implying but not verifying geological or grade continuity. Indicated can assume that there is continuity and that you can apply modifying factors to allow you to generate an ore reserve. And measured confirms the geological and grade continuity. So the key thing is it's all about you as a competent person understanding what the risks are in your deposit. What are the matters? What matters the most is that you read the code. Peter Stoker will always tell you read the code and understand it. Reporting is, is, a, is a step that is a fairly, it's the very last bit, but it's the really important bit as well because it's what might go to the public. So you've got to define your cutoff criteria. What are the reasonable prospects of economic extraction? Oh, well, it's half a gram because everybody uses half a gram. No longer is good enough. ASIC will be on your back. You need to describe how you've come to your assumptions around cutoff criteria. What are these aspects of your mind that are important? Have you got a, a copper concentrate? Has it got arsenic in it that you'll never be able to sell it? Or 
does it have material within it that's uh, you know that's harder than anything else and you'll you can never grind it fine enough uh, to to extract it without costing too much so you do need to take a lot of aspects into consideration when you're defining what are the reasonable prospects and you know you've got all these other bits and pieces I'm not going to go through each of those at the end of the day of course if you're issuing a public report you've got to sign off and, and consent to it and you have to be able to stand up in, for, in front of a group of your peers and give your reasoning why something is wrong if it gets that far if something is wrong which has happened in the past there are situations where whether it's the AIG or the OSIM mean that you're a member of that mean that you have to be responsible and be responsive to questions about how you've done something and if you've been shown to be less than adequate in your catering for all of the risk then you may be at worst case scenario struck from the ability to report lastly not least the the, the last item is tons and great you know it, we have a the, the end result is a block model that you can report out of volume tons grade based on the distribution of grade within the block model the density of the material and the you know the, the reasonable prospects is it within an optimized pit is it within a, uh, a high enough grade to support underground mining all of these sorts of things need to be shown to show what the sensitivities are so that a person who hasn't necessarily got a full resource estimation set of skills can look at it and say oh wow they're really the grade is really sensitive or the tons are really sensitive to the grade in this area and we're talking about you know uh, mining it below cutoff uh, most of the time so we need to be uh, giving information around tons of grade um, I think that is it. So I know it's a, a, a very quick rush through resource estimation. You need a week at least to understand it. But uh, I'll leave it at that since I'm way over time. Thanks, Rod. Uh, no, no you, you've done pretty well um, considering the uh, today's start. But uh, while people are furiously typing their questions away, I hope, um, I'll uh, kick proceedings off with a question for you. Um, having been in the position to review projects with resources and not being a resource geologist um, and doing the what I think is a sensible idea and, and obviously looking at the resource block model with the drill hole data and taking sections through that, often finding that the grade in the drill holes don't look anything like the block model. Is it unrealistic to expect that the block model should look a fair bit like the drill holes? Well, one of the critical steps along the validation of your block model is can you see the, the, the relative grade of the block increasing and decreasing associated with your drilling? You do, of course, have to take into account that the grade is the uh, blend of a number of drill holes you may not be able to see that drill hole on that particular section you have to take into account the fact that there are holes either side that may be influencing the grade on that section you do need to look at it in 3d but in general terms if you've got low grade in a drill hole you should see low grade in a block and vice versa high grade you should see high grade so if you're seeing variance between that that is a bit of a red flag it's saying that the estimate is not necessarily being able to see locally what the uh, drill holes are telling you so it depends on the estimation methodology a bit what the block size is and uh, you know whether or not it's a local estimate or a global estimate. Okay, thanks, Rod. Uh, question from uh, Roland Zeta. How to audit resource estimation? Can you suggest to how to learn about it? Um, yeah, it, it's the, the best way is really by having enough skill in 
uh, the estimation process. How do you learn the estimation process by yourself without being involved in a, uh, a, a consultancy like mine where we, we do this sort of thing on a, on a weekly basis is, is quite difficult. The, the best way is really to be in mining geology, honestly. Exploration geology, it's very difficult to gain the skills to become a resource estimate geologist. The mining geology it, it, daily, you're doing estimates. You're doing grade control estimates on a daily basis. You're pushing buttons. You're making decisions about what is ore and waste. And so, you know, to move into uh, the role as a grade estimation geologist is, is a really critical step to becoming a full bone uh, resource estimate geologist. Uh, the other aspect then is that you, on top of that, you need to do postgraduate studies in geostatistics. That's, I can't recommend strongly enough that at the end of the day, that will give you a toolkit to understand what the aspects are, are that are important to get an estimate correct. But it, from an exploration geology point of view, it's virtually impossible. I wouldn't recommend it. I really wouldn't. I, you, you need to either have that position in mining geology or move into uh, uh, an, an office with the resource estimation geologist and look over his shoulder for about three years. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Rob. Um, you mentioned uh, and went through a little bit about declustering data. Um, given that particularly in exploration and I guess when getting to more advanced and getting closer to a resource or mining situation, um, our data collection is more and more biased uh, for obvious reasons. We only want to drill the important parts. We don't want to drill waste and, and uh, other things. Um, could you expand a little bit more on declustering and how that works when your data gets more and more concentrated rather than less and less? Yeah, look, I... Uh I guess the, I'm just trying to get the right video because it's on my laptop, not on my other one. Just two secs. Oh, it doesn't see it. Great. Okay. I won't. I'll talk to you down here. Um, so, yes, but, but declustering is, it's around, if you have a, a limited space to drill from, uh, whether it be underground or in the case where I had it from the top of the hill, um, what happens is you get a lot of data in, in close spaced uh, intervals uh, at the top of the hole and very wide spaced data at the bottom of the hole. And if your domain is, um, uh, you know, the samples that are being driving the domain statistics are all very closely spaced, they override the statistics influence from the samples that are broadly spread. So you, you cater for that by declustering and saying that these samples that are widely spaced have an equal statistical influence than the ones that are very closely spaced. So we're not necessarily talking about the differences between um, uh, 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 a drill hole that's perpendicular to the ore body and coming in closer spaced. And if you've got, say, you know, a shear host of uh, gold deposit, you've got a lot of samples very close together in the middle of the ore body where it's the highest grade and less as you go out. Same thing applies. It's, it's, it's really about making sure that statistically you give that domain the, the same level of um, viability for the statistics to drive the variogram. Okay, thanks Rod. Uh, question from Mark Rigby. Uh, what is the best way to deal with different different of data? Some databases will have samples collected over several decades, some of which probably has no QAQC, different sample and FA methods. Any other questions? Oh, you missed that one. Uh, Mark Sorry, you just broke up a bit. Yeah, I missed that one. Um, oh, yeah. Mark, g'day Mark, how are you? Um, what is the best way to deal with different generations of data? Some databases will have samples collected over several decades. Some mm. probably has no QAQC and different samples and FA, assay methods, etc. Yep. Very common scenario. Uh, uh, 
look, it, it, you, under JORC, you really need to show some evidence that the historic information is valid. You don't need to re-drill everything. What you need to do is some select, if it's, well, you know, if there's core available, selective resampling. If it's RC, it'll gone, you won't have anything. Uh, you know, you, you probably need to do some selective re-drilling and show statistically that there's no difference between the old drilling and the new drilling. Um, if there is QAQC, uh, you can show that at least the uh, accuracy and precision have been dealt with. And then if the information between, you, you can look at it statistically across years as well. Look at the information spatially, but also look at it from a time domain point of view. And you could, you could potentially see variation as, as a say, precision increases. You know, we moved from, uh, you know, uh, Aquary to digest to a uh, four acid digest. Uh, we've moved from AAS to ICP. We've decreased the detection limit. Detection limits are really important. You've got to understand because if you if you're sort of dealing with really old information, detection limits uh, can be high enough that if we have to rule out previous information, just disregard it and use only the new information. Um, from a job point of view, the, the clear thing is being open and transparent about what the data looks like, what its age is, what its reliability is, what the risk of it is, and try and mitigate the risks through whatever methods you can. Okay, thanks, Rod. Um, you're breaking up a little bit, but uh, we have one very last question and then we'll call it a day. Uh, this is from Katut Jiri. How do you use creating a fit efficiency value in resource category? Okay, so the Krigging efficiency is, is a measure of, if we go back, I might just share my screen quickly and go back to one slide and go back to this slide. So we, we, the slope of regression is one issue, which we've talked about. Um, but also the creaking efficiency is really the width of this uh, population. It's the spread of the population. The wider the spread, the more likely you are to misallocate. So the lower, the, the more efficient, more creaking efficiency, the higher the creaking efficiency, the higher the likelihood is of getting the true block grade correct. So, you, it, it, it's a statistical um, method to show whether your domain can be relied upon and the, the higher the efficiency, the better off you are in the same way that the, the, the closer your slope of regression is to one, the better off you are. And it's, it's, it's fine tuning things. It's not black and white. You can't just say, oh, well, I'm only going to use it if it's this, or I'm only going to use it with that. You have to use the data you've got. But your creaking efficiency is just a measure of how uh, accurately the estimation is able to predict the grade based on the samples and the domain shapes. Excellent. Thanks very much, Rod. Um, we're uh, on time there, and uh, rather than uh, testing the uh, NVN gods any further, I think we might call it a day. Thanks very much for your time, Rod. No worries. Thank you very much, and thanks everybody for listening. And yes, indeed. Thanks for everyone for uh, working through our issues, and we, we got there in the end. And we'll see you all in a month's time for the next AIG ALS uh, Tech Talk. Good afternoon, all. Thanks, Pete.